Mr. Crispin here once again. You know, I've been making use of the nice weather and I've been doing a few outside things, but I'm back in the workshop today and it's time to make some progress on the locomotive. And in today's video, I'll be manufacturing the nuts required for the cylinder block assemblies. Today's footage will feature three types of nuts. There's going to be eight hex nuts, two disc nuts and one machining nut. They're going to be out of stainless steel and let me show you what they look like. Within the cylinder block assembly lie a total of 10 nuts. Four hex nuts in each cylinder and one disc nut in each cylinder. Now the disc nut is an addition of my own and it is to help retain the piston on the rod. In cross section it looks something like that and in 3D something like that. I have here a piece of 5.8 stainless steel from which I'm going to make all of the nuts. Now, typically in milling you would use a dividing head to produce a hexagon, but as you'll see I don't have a dividing head on here, I have a vice. A vice in fact that was given to me by Rich Ingley. And I'm going to demonstrate another method that I find slightly handier, and that is to use what's called a collet block. So this is a ground up steel block and it accepts a normal ER40 collet. Uh, it's all nice and accurate, and what happens is the bar is offered up to the collet. And indexing can then be done by means of these reference surfaces. So by rotating six times, I have effectively indexed the pot six equal times. Uh, now, typically when a collet block is used, it's placed in a vise and the flats align everything. As you can see though here, I'm going to have a lot sticking out and I don't really like milling with uh, as little support as that. So I'm going to do a bit of reverse psychology on it. Instead of hanging on to the collet block, I'm going to take a one, two, three block, sit that on the bed, and use that to index and reference the collet block. So now I can actually hang on to the material that I'm cutting by means of two line contacts down the diameter, and as I want to index, I just rotate like that. Now longitudinal positioning is not an issue here because there are no longitudinal requirements. I want a hex that's longer than required for all the nuts. But if it was, a uh, vice stop could be used or something similar to control longitudinal positions. So with that placed in the vice, all I will have to do is come down with the cutter, touch on the top and come in a calculated amount and then rotate six times. The maths for this is very straightforward. I have a diameter, 5.8, 625,000. And the across flat dimension I'm trying to produce is 0.56 of an inch, which is just under 9 sixteenths and should allow a standard spanner to go on with ease. So uh, you minus the across flat dimension from the diameter, that gives you the sum of this and this. And then you divide that by two to give you the uh, final amount. And in that case, uh, it's roughly 32, 33 thumb. So I'll be doing that now. A check with a micrometer confirms the depth of cut was correct and uh, I can now move on to give everything a quick clean and index to the next position. Now one little thing to mention, and you may have noticed on my sketch, is that the machine flats don't actually meet each other. There's a small section of the radius left in each case and that in this case is quite handy because it means that as I index the part, the gripping method is always the same there's still a little section of that radius left for the jaws to contact with. Were I taking the hex to a smaller size, such that I would have a sharp machined corner, uh, I would actually be gripping on effectively knife edges, so to speak, as I go around. So that is the use of a collet block. I would consider a dividing head more accurate personally, but for things like this, uh, a collet block is very handy. One thing that may not have been obvious there is to check for good alignment, I use a one thou feeler gauge between the one, two, three block and the collet block surface to make sure that things are consistent. And uh, that has done the job nicely. And I now have a hexagon that I can proceed with. Well that's the hexagon sorted, but what about my disc nuts? Well, uh, 
The only other operation to do on this machine is to put these two holes in for the pin spanner. And while I'm at the machine, I'm actually going to do it now. And I'm going to do this by reversing the component and holding it upwards and putting the two holes in the top end. Having produced a flat top, I have found the centre of the component and having found the centre of the component, I'm now going to make a positional move. Now when you're uh, centering a spindle and tweaking all the axes, it's easy to forget about the backlash. But now I'm ready to make a move, I've got to think about the backlash. So I'm going to be moving the table this way. So I'm going to position the stylus in line with the direction I'm about to move the table. And then I'm going to wind it all the way off and all the way back on in the direction I'm going until the clock returns to its reading. Now I know the spindle is above the workpiece and the backlash is taken out in the direction I'm about to travel. With milling complete, it's time to move to the lathe. Just before I get to drilling the final tapping diameter, I am uh, ensuring concentricity by taking a little skim as deep as possible with this uh, little boring bar. I have drilled to final diameter and chamfered the hole and I am now tapping by allowing the tail stock to slide and rotating the spindle by hand. As the spindle rotates it draws the tail stock assembly inwards. I have now tapped this as deep as the tap will allow and I'm going to start forming some knots before I then come back in and tap deeper. Um, now you may be wondering is this not too much stick out? and often for beginners there are rules of thumb such as no more stick out than twice the diameter but when it comes to defining exactly how much stick out is too much stick out it really comes to the specifics and in this case it's a piece of stainless steel and a relatively free machining at that so it's nice and rigid if this were a piece of plastic it would push off more I'm holding it in a collet and a collet really hugs the diameter and gives a better work holding solution than the typical three jaws on a chuck. And also all I'm doing is taking light facing cuts and parting. So although parting can sometimes be a problem, it's quite a narrow tool, it's very sharp and I don't think it's going to cause a problem in this case. So with those things in mind, I don't believe this is too much stick out. I will very shortly be proved right or wrong. With regards to the cutting tool, I have ground up a little tool that looks like this. And why have I done that? So that I can do all the operations with one tool. It looks something like this. And the front side of the tool has got some clearance on it to allow for a straight parting cut. The end of the tool is sloped forwards to minimise the burr on the parted component. You know, if that was the other way, it would separate the nut from the driving stock before fully cleaning up this face. I'll show a close up of that later. And then coming around here we have a small nose radius and another clearance angle. That will allow it to uh, do a normal parting motion but also take a fine facing cut when required. And this section of the tool here is angled backwards such that when this reaches a given depth it nicely chamfers the nut. Now also I can measure the width of this tool with a micrometer and by calculating then the parting width added to the knot width, I can pitch over to give me a very predictable finished uh, knot width. Now there will actually be a second operation here once I've parted all eight of these off, I will be reversing them and using this section of the tool to finish the other side. Okay, so I'm touching on. Take a facing cut and chamfer the nut. I'm going to just do all this at the same spindle speed to um, improve the efficiency a bit. I come to my uh, 
zero and that should have chamfered the periphery and now I come in with the countersink feed across 225,000 and now to part off If anyone thinks parting stainless steel is difficult, try doing it with your hand through the middle of a tripod. Okay, now I take another facing cut. You could combine the uh, parting and facing operation, but seeing as I'm not in a hurry, I'll take the uh, good surface finish you get from doing it in two goes. OK, back to the zero, that's chamfered the nut. And we come to countersink. And so on. Nearly there now. Okay, I'm now going to remove the part and clean everything and I'm then going to reverse the component to reveal these two holes and then I will drill and tap, face off, uh, skim the OD and I'll be parting a couple of blanks off ready to finish the reverse side of. So I need to hold these nuts the other way around somehow to finish them off and yes I can make a little fixture or hold them in a three jaw chuck but when making an assembly of components I often like to look for opportunities within that assembly to use components as fixtures and this sometimes can save you having to make a special fixture and can be quite accurate. So here's a simple example of such an opportunity and uh, this could be taken forward to more complicated setups as I hope to show in the future. Ahead of machining the valve rods and piston rods I've been doing a bit of practice. Both rods have screw cut threads on them and I wanted to do a bit of a test piece both to prove the machine cutting 40 TPI and also upon achieving a good fit with the piston I wanted to record the dimension over wires so that when I come to uh, cut the rods for real life I will have something to aim for. Now uh, with this chest piece here as it is I have an opportunity now to modify it in such a way that I can use it to finish the knots off so in effect turn it into a little fixture and I will show that now. So I am putting a knot on here and nipping it up and now I'm going to trim the Full change and prepare for facing and chamfering. And a slight adjustment of tool post angle is required. Okay, I'm going to take a light cut, remove the nut, and measure it. And go from there. So I'm aiming for 130 thou and I'm coming in at 153 so I can make an adjustment to the settings and carry on.
Now call me Mr Particular but the final thing I'm doing to these nuts is putting in a counterbore on one side of every nut and this way when the two nuts come together I shall assemble them counterboard side to non counterboard side and it will improve the mating nature of the two faces. That is because with these knots being so thin I've had to put very shallow chamfers in meaning that at one section of the ball the thread almost comes out and as you start tightening these together perhaps multiple times that bit of thread can start to pull out and if you've got no relief chamfer or counterbore big enough to contain that you can affect how the actual uh, faces are mating. Hex knots complete and I've even ended up with a spare one so if anyone out there is down a knot just let me know. As for the disc knots they actually go in the back of the piston and when I come to finish the pistons and everything's assembled I will then face all this off flush so I'm going to leave those uh, sticking out proud for now. Well there we are, who thought you would be able to stand nearly 20 minutes of looking at hex knots, never mind a machining knot. I will say that the most efficient way to do this is to buy a hexagon bar and start with a ready made hex and that's readily available so you could do that. Also you could cut quite a few of the operations out but you know I've been outside painting this wall and as I've been painting I've been thinking it through and I've ended up with more and more operations. Uh, so just to settle with my normal critics, actually yes. I could have thought of a more complicated way to do this if I tried. But apart from that, I hope you've enjoyed watching and see you on the next video.